one of the things as we uh, as we were talking, you know, people were talking about uh, prohibition ending, and um, one of the things <laughs> my mind as we were uh, as as we were talking was was not just that that will be a gradual progression, but it'll be really really fragile. You know, it's it's at any moment it can backtrack again. Um, we see that at the moment with harm reduction. You think it's kind of stable, and then all of a sudden you get a new political party, and he says, Nah, you know what? Don't really like the sound of that quite as much. Um, and as, as I was talking about this presentation, my colleague Patrick was up the back and he says, you know what, after prohibition, the first overdose death is going to be a really bad press day. You know, and, and it wasn't to be glib, it was to say, you know what, that's going to be on us. And it's going to be, see, I told you so. See, it's starting. You know, the first kid that gets into their parents' legally purchased stash and comes to harm out of it, see, I told you so. It's all starting now, and that's the fragility of it, I think. Um, this is called, by the way, Children After the Drug War, Lessons in Unintended Negative Consequences. And then I realized that um, I hate that phrase, unintended negative consequences, because we know the consequences, and if you've foreseen them and you carry on regardless, that's negligence, or recklessness, or, or just blatant disregard. So I put in missed opportunities instead, because I want us to imagine we're in the future here. Um, I want us to imagine that uh, we, we've done away with prohibition, and we're already there, okay? Now, um, Hopefully this will work. There we go. Look. Okay, so, uh, you know, during the pro this is my book, by the way, See Children of the Drug War. And I'm not going to get into it. It's free to download online at childrenofthedrugwar.org. It's a Creative Commons uh, book. And it's got 16 chapters in it from different authors, and it's about all sorts of harms to children and young people uh, caused by drug policy. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it because I think that would be wasting time talk, talking to people who know that. It does have a chapter in it, though, by Steve Rolls, who wrote Blueprint. And uh, I asked Steve to write the chapter. He, he sits in the desk, desk next to me in, in our office, so it's kind of easy to get him. And I asked him to write a chapter uh, about how legal regulation and control would better protect children, which he did, and it's very good. Um, so the two main points. Look, the harms to children from drug policy, I think, are legion. And regulation will make things better on many, many metrics. Yeah, uh, you can pick any, any one. Um, but my, my point, and what I want to get to is this, right? Imagine the criminal market's done away with. We're now into a legally regulated market that we put in place. Any of the unintended consequences of that, that's on us. Um, so for the rest of my presentation, we're not allowed, we're not entitled to the comparison anymore, right? You're not allowed to say, well, you know, at least it's not as bad as it used to be. Because that doesn't help the people being harmed in our future scenario, right? And in my case, I, I have uh, children in mind because, um, well, I'm a parent, but also I used to work in child rights before I got into drug policy. So that's my, that's my starting point, right? We're not entitled to the comparison. Keep that in mind, because I'm going to say some things where it will jump in. You think, oh, well, geez, at least it's not criminal gangsters. Um, and the, it leads me to my first point, actually. Uh, yesterday, one of the speakers in, in, in uh, Charles's film, she said, um, you know, we don't have to do anything much. We just have to undo something bad we did. Uh, it's, it's, I don't actually agree, and I'll tell you why. Because um, it's been around for a long time, Prohibition, and the world has changed. It's a very, very different place now. Um, and one of the biggest phenomena in the last 50 years is the multinational corporation. So, we have, to, we, have to, we have to be a bit vigilant here, right? It's all well and good to talk about you know, small level vineyard models and cannabis dispensaries and all that kind of stuff. But fighting off that lobby is going to be really, really hard. Um, and from evidence, we know they can't be trusted. And just thinking about kids, right? We've got the Nestle breast milk scandal in developing countries. You've got junk food. You've got pouring Ritalin into children that don't need it. You've got Alka Pops and the grotesque marketing of alcohol in, in uh, developing countries. And of course, we got the biggie, we got cigarettes. That last um, um, little photo there, it's, it's an article in Tobacco Control about British American tobacco on Facebook. Uh, one of their little ways of getting around, uh, getting around uh, advertising. Um, now, that's all difficult to manage. Again, there, the opportunity there is that with corporations, you, there are levers you can bring to bear that you can't on criminal gangsters, and that's one of the benefits. But like I said, ignore the, uh, the comparison. We need to actually bring those things to bear. And that's going to have to start being thought through right now. It gets, it gets alluded to in Blueprint. You know, we have to deal with advertising. We have to deal with this. 
right, but we need to see a little bit more detail if when these harms start to be on us, we can say, look, even if we use the word due diligence, look, we're doing our best, right? There's going to be some fallout and we're going to try and mitigate it. Uh, I just think if we get stuck in the comparison with criminal gangsters, we're not going to move on. Um, so my point here is that the corporations are difficult. Uh, it's difficult to, to trust them. We talk about taking drugs, illegal or illicit or controlled or whatever we want to call them drugs, out of the international drug control system, fine. I'm not sure I want them under the auspices of the World Trade Organization either. And uh, with that in mind, um, what you see, I mean, the, the corporation itself, there's an interesting quote here, let me see this. Um, I'll read this one. Right. This activity is flexible and opportunistic, naturally exploiting the most vulnerable workforce and seeking out locations where it can operate with minimum cost and interference. Sounds like a corporation to me, right? That's Steve Rose talking about criminal gangsters in the drug market. Um, these two photographs are not related to drugs, but they are uh, fables in, in, in negatives. The first one is about water privatization in a place called, uh, well, two places in South Africa, Fury and Orange Farm. And the reason I bring it up is because a British company, Northumbrian Water, owned 51% of the water management company in Johannesburg. Now, what they did was they imposed water limiting devices that made people prepay for their water. And that happens in developing countries, but what's interesting, of course, is that it's illegal to do that here. This one on the right, that's Cape PLC, and what they were doing was asbestos mining in Africa, and that's illegal to do here as well since the 1960s. Both of these ended up with trials, and in both cases, the plaintiffs won. Good news. Um, because that one ended up in a massive cholera outbreak, and that one ended up with people dying of asbestosis. Um, why do I bring it up here? Well, it's this. Child labor, right? Yes, the comparison, children work in the drug trade with criminal gangsters, but that won't be on us anymore. What we'll have to deal with is the fact that corporations might possibly use children in their work for something that we pushed for. That's on us. So that picture there is a child in Kazakhstan working in a legal, totally illicit tobacco plantation. His hands are destroyed because of the nature of the work. It's a similar injury you get as a rasp machine uh, uh, pulling coca leaves. Um, and I'm not sure I want Philip Morris International, by the way, controlling cannabis, and I'm not sure I want any of these uh, corporations with their hands on coca. I'd be really surprised if there isn't already a genetically modified uh, Roundup-ready coca leaf out there somewhere, if I'm really conspiratorial, because here's my sales pitch. I'm Monsanto. I'll walk out down to the Colombian government, I'll say, you know what? Here's how you're going to control this. I'm going to spray the crap out of everything with this chemical, but I've made a plant that can resist it, you can control it, and we can sell it. And I don't think that's any less offensive to the indigenous people and the campesinos who are currently worried with the criminal gangsters. Um, but we do have child labor standards now. This brings us back to that point about international law. International Labor Organization Convention 182 on the worst forms of child labor should protect children from that and from any involvement in remaining uh, criminal activities if they're going to be exploited in that way. So we need to be able to foresee that and bring it to bear now. There's a big difference between a 16-year-old as a as a, uh, you know, a part-time lounge boy like we all did in Dublin and uh, one of these kids working in a plantation because they don't go to school and, uh, and they work too long hours and so on and so forth and they work with chemicals they shouldn't be anywhere near. Um, bear in mind though, that, you know, Human Rights Watch did this report in Kazakhstan, it's called Hellish Work, well worth a read. But like the response from Philip Morris International was really positive, they don't want this. It's bad PR, right? So, there is, the avenue is there, the opportunity is there to fix that. You can't do that with criminal gangsters, so that's, you know, back to my, my, uh, my comparison. My other thing is this. Uh, after the war on drugs, children will still use drugs. And it's not going to get any less controversial, no matter how many consenting adults are doing what they want to do. Um, that thing there is not a movie. I did a poster for a conference a while ago, because I think conference posters are a bit daft. I, I did this instead about uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, uh, demands harm reduction for young people. Again, international law is useful. Um, it won't get any less controversial, and they're going to keep doing it. And one of my problems with current arguments around regulation is that uh, it's, it, it's kind of sidestepped. Uh, you know, oh, well, of course, we'll put an age limit on it. You know, you can't buy this stuff if you're under 18. It's like, yeah, fine, but they'll still get their hands on it, right? And it might be safer, and they might buy it from a safer place or get it from an adult walking into a, a, a place like I used to when we wanted booze when we were 14. But again, there might be side effects, and that's on us. And, 
And even in lobbying to get to a, a post-prohibition world, I worry about a few things. One of them is trade-offs. Um, how to describe this? It's like saying things like, oh, well, you know what? Let's just get towards regulation, but uh, yeah, we'll put that age limit on. Or you see it with harm reduction programs now. Look, just give us our program. And they say, well, fine, but if you're under 21, you're not getting in. It's like, uh, okay. We can't allow that to happen because um, we need to be able to foresee the other laws that need to be amended, right? Um, we heard earlier about the Misuse of Drugs Act. In lots of countries, you've got your Central Narcotics Act, but then you've got other ones, child protection laws that might need to be amended, for example. You've got what are called aiding and abetting laws or encouragement laws. So one of the trade-offs, we'll say, I'll tell you what, um, let's, let's you know, decriminalize, but if you encourage a child to use drugs, we're really gonna slam down and, you know, there's a, and there's a real danger that we'll say, yeah, okay, you know, we'll accept that. But they're probably gonna get their first drugs from their peers and friends. And what you're gonna do is discourage harm reduction programs from serving young people because they're accused of uh, promoting drug use. That carries a seven to 12 year sentence in the Ukraine, by the way, uh, encouraging a child to use drugs. Um, and of course, harm reduction workers go, I'm sorry, you're just gonna have to inject in that dirty alley over there because I can't go anywhere near you. Bad outcome, that's on us. Um, so that leads me to working now with the big controversy in, in, in our field in harm reduction, which is harm reduction for young people. Really, really hard to get this through. Um, I saw a headline the other day, they're giving crack pipes to kids in Vancouver. It's like, no, your headline is, kids are smoking crack in Vancouver. You know, it's like, uh, there's a real misunderstanding about harm reduction for adults, never mind for, for young people. And what I see around age on this, by the way, is age is a, should be an issue of risk and threshold of intervention, not an issue of exclusion. Uh, it's a clinical decision in consultation with the young person, and if you put an age on it, you just uh, destroy uh, everybody's ability to make the right decisions. Uh, both of those points bring me to something else, and the issue I talked about, about uh, double standards are looking for the weakest place, um, which is the operation of regulatory models there. That's our planet. And a lot of what we read is very US, very UK. Uh, I'm not being a cultural relativist here, I'm just saying that if you go to most of these places, the infrastructure is not there to put that stuff in place. It's not there now. Uh, and again, remember, I'm not allowing the comparison. Um, but I'm just saying we can put all the regulatory controls in we like, and it won't operate in some of these places. So what do we do about it? Um, that's very difficult. And it brings me back to the multinationals who are gonna find some of these places, most of which are far more populous than where we live, as the markets they're gonna to go to if they get their hands on this stuff. Uh, I'm not the doomsayer, by the way, I'm sold. Right? We should, you know, we should uh, regulate and control currently illicit drugs. I just wanna watch out for the dangers, which are gonna bombard us. Um, yeah, that brings me to my, so I wanted to join that up with those two previous points that we've got to look at the supply side and the whole supply chain and who's going to control that. And we need to look at the fact that no matter what we do, young people and children will still use drugs. Remember I said we can't change the world. More kids are using drugs now than when we started this prohibitionist enterprise. We're going to have to deal with it and it's become more and more normalized. We're going to have to deal with it, but they're not going to be dealt with in the same regulatory framework as adults and I haven't seen that properly dealt with yet. Um, now my last point is, is, is not to, to um, pour cold water either, but I wanna put all this in perspective about the stuff that kind of matters when it comes to drug-related harms, which is all that. Um, when we change drug laws, we're doing only a, a really small thing. It, it happens to be very difficult and it's taken a very long time to get this far in the debate, but really if you're looking at drug-related harms and harms to people, or even, I put up culture and tradition there around what laws you need to put in place. There's a lot else going on. And if we lose sight of that, uh, I don't think we're gonna solve all the problems we think we're gonna solve with legal regulation uh, and control. Um, so, you know, in closing, look, uh, I look forward to the day when we're, when we're talking about prohibition in history books rather than the news headlines, but uh, I think when it comes to kids, I think we've got a hell of a lot to think about and I look forward to developing the conversation in the whole Blueprint project and how we can keep those conversations going. Thanks very much. See, I told you so. See, it's starting. You know, the first kid that gets into their parents' legally purchased stash and comes to harm out of it. See, I told you so. It's all starting now and that's the fragility of it, I think. Um, this is called, by the way, Children After the Drug War, Lessons in Unintended Negative Consequences. And then I realized that um, I hate 
that phrase unintended negative consequence suddenly you get a new political party and he says nah you know what don't really like the sound of that quite as much um, and as, as I was talking about this presentation to my colleague Patrick who's up the back and he says you know what after prohibition the first overdose death is going to be really bad press day you know and, and it wasn't to be glib it was to say you know what that's going to be on us and it's going to be we're talking about uh, prohibition ending and um, one of the things my mind as we were uh, as as it was talking was was not just that that would be a gradual progression but it'll be really really fragile you know it's it's at any moment it can backtrack again um, we see that at the moment with harm reduction you think it's kind of stable and then all of One of the things as we, uh, as we were talking, you know, people were consequences, because we know the consequences, and if you've foreseen them and you carry on regardless, that's negligence, or recklessness, or, or just blatant disregard. So I put in missed opportunities instead, because I want us to imagine we're in the future here. Um, I want us to imagine that uh, we, we've done away with prohibition, we're already there, okay? Now, um, 